to be. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for being here, either online or in the room. We're excited to have you join us for today's seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the Research Program Manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon. Um, just a reminder, this is a hybrid event, so we do have folks both in the ether and in the room. Um, and to accommodate that, uh, we ask that if you have questions for folks in the room, that you raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. For folks that are online, we have a wonderful volunteer, Rose, who will be monitoring any questions, or if you have any technical issues, please let us know so we can address those. Um, we are going to be playing a little bit with our technology moving back and forth between PowerPoint and online, so please let us know if something doesn't look like it should or like we're expecting it to. Um, wanted to make a couple of announcements. Um, this event is being recorded, so that means that you can share it with others in the future if you would like. Um, for anybody who missed today's seminar, it will be posted on the past seminar uh, page um, in a few days. Also wanted to let folks know that are here as students. Um, Michael's in the room and is watching chat, so if you have any questions, go ahead and talk to him um, via the chat. The other thing I wanted to just let folks know is, of course, because of the two holidays next week, we will not be doing seminar, um, but we will have a seminar the following week. And that same week, we're going to do a science on tap. So the science on tap is on the 30th, and we're going to be talking about gray whales in Oregon waters. Um, and that's Lee Torres and the GEM lab going to be doing that. So that'll be a really great one. The other thing we have um, for next two weeks out seminar on December 1st, already December 1st. Um, we have Ken Ziegler, who will be talking, uh, who is a postdoc from the University of California. Hopefully he'll be able to join us by that time. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, conservation physiology about anadromous West Coast fishes. So um, that'll be an exciting one to uh, come and listen to on December 1st. Uh, if you are curious about any of our events, you can go to the Hatfield homepage, log to the bottom, scroll to the bottom, um, and you'll get a calendar of events there, and you can see all the login information. But the reason we're all here today is we have two amazing speakers that I'm going to quickly introduce, and then I'm going to hand the floor off to them so that they can um, get started with what we're doing. Uh, our remote speaker is Dan Sboda, who works with the Oregon Department of Environmental Equality, developing watershed scale models, examining water quality, and working with stakeholders to develop management plans to reduce pollution and improve water quality. He received his bachelor's from Virginia Tech, and then moved to Oregon to earn his master's and his PhD in stream ecology, examining controls of nitrate dynamics in the upper Willamette Basin. After his PhD, he held postdocs in Washington State University's Vancouver campus and um, at the US EPA laboratory in Corvallis, examining watershed scale sources and impacts of reactive nitrogen. And in the room, we have Brian uh, Fulfrost, who is currently the principal at Brian Fulfrost and Associates. Um, he teaches GIS online at um, SF State as well as remote sensing at the University of West Florida online. Brian has been doing in geospatial sciences, focusing on conservation and sustainability for more than 25 years. For the last 15 years, Brian has been working on mapping and building decision support tools for coastal environments. This work includes using high resolution multi spectral imaging for mapping marshes and mud flats um, in South Bay salt ponds um, in transition zones under sea level rise and using GIS based modeling to map shoreline vulnerability in coastal flooding zones. His most recent work, however, has been on remote sensing of harmful algal blooms. They're both here to talk about that work today. So I'm going to hand it off to Brian. Hey, uh oh, that's loud. All right. Um, I think we're going to start with Dan. Dan's going to start. Yeah, the yeah I, I can start in. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, thanks for, for having us. Um, I appreciate the invite and I'm excited to talk about this work that, that's been being developed over the past several years. Um, uh, as someone said, my name's uh, Dan, Dan Sabota. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Brian, who was with Oregon DEQ uh, when he initiated a lot of this work. 
Um, and it, we've, we've continued that on and, and been working with Brian after he's left the EQ to, to, to develop this, uh, this uh, project. But I also want to acknowledge the other co-authors, Yuan Grund and Aaron Costello. Yuan in particular has really done a lot of the heavy lifting for the analyses and, and the, the tools that have been developed here. And I really, I really appreciate her work on the project. Um, next slide, Brian. I think you're in control. Yeah, uh, just to start off with, uh, we just give a just a, a basic outline of the the, the uh, topics we're going to be covering today. Uh, I'm going to start off. Uh, many people on the on the call or or in the in the room may be familiar with cyanobacteria and harmful cyanobacteria blooms, but I, I always like to start off with an overview just to get everyone on the same page uh, for the discussion. Uh, we're going to cover using satellite imagery for harmful cyanobacteria blooms. What, what are the advantages to that? What are some, maybe some of the disadvantages? And then some of the the um, the, work, the, ap the applications we've been developing um, within the state of Oregon, and we'll conclude with the uh, successes, successes, challenges, and opportunities of the work. Um, just adding the explanation points, just to emphasize that we um, do have uh, you know a number of successes uh, as well as challenges and some of the opportunities, I guess. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so yeah, to start off with, uh, just as a background, uh, you know, harmful cyanobacteria blooms. Um, what we're talking about here is excessive growth of aquatic photosynthetic bacteria. Um, it's often grouped under the, the the term harmful algal bloom, and you probably have seen a number of acronyms related to this. We talked about HABs already, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, HTBs would be the same as a HAB or cyanohab. And we're talking also about these blooms in freshwater systems. Uh, when you get to harmful algal blooms, obviously in marine habitats, you have a, a wider variety of algal types that can contribute to uh, harmful blooms. I mean, you can have that in freshwater too, but we mainly focus on cyanobacteria blooms and that's the, obviously the focus of our work here today. Um, there's obviously a lot of material that's available to, to look at the harmful algal blooms or, or HTBs uh, online. Uh, one resource that I found particularly useful comes from the uh, Interstate uh, Technological Regulatory Council. They developed some pretty good documents on uh, HCVs, and I've provided a, we provided a link here. Um, and you might be asking, well, why do we care about uh, some bacteria blooms? And the the biggest thing is um, they they can be capable of producing toxins that are harmful to human health, livestock, and wildlife. And they can also degrade ecosystem conditions, uh, causing water quality impairments, uh, crashing dissolved oxygen, creating excessively high pH values. Um, and from a human perspective, it can create some pre pretty unpleasant aesthetics uh, when visiting a water body for recreational purposes. Um, and because of that, uh, this can impact uh, a number of different resources from drinking water uh, quality, or recreational opportunities. Uh, it affects agricultural production. Uh, as well as local economies and, and overall aquatic habitats. And there have been some pretty high profile uh, incidences within Oregon related to uh, HCBs over the past several years. I think many of you may be familiar with the, uh, the Salem water crisis that happened in 2018, where uh, there was a do not drink order uh, issued for vulnerable populations because of contamination of cyanotoxins um, in Detroit, from Detroit Reservoir uh, downstream. Uh, there was also a case several years ago where um, a toxic bloom of um, a cyanobacteria was linked to the death of um, cattle within Oregon, in Southern Oregon, in Lake County, it killed 32 cattle, which amounted to, I want to say, 80 or $90,000 worth of, uh, of loss uh, for that particular farmer. So it, it does have some pretty significant local impacts. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, just as a starter, you know, you might be interested, you know, might be interested in what causes HCDs, particularly in freshwater systems. Um, and that's been a pretty well-researched topic. It, there's obviously continuing research on the subject, uh, but some of the main factors that have been identified are things like high nutrient inputs from uh, anthropogenic activities like wastewater treatment plant discharge, atmospheric deposition, agricultural runoff, things like that, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in particular. Uh, warmer temperatures, cyanobacteria tend to thrive with, at, at warmer temperatures, as well as kind of more stable uh, water environments, so slow-moving or stagnant or, or stratified water uh, waters. Um, there can also be, and those are mainly what I consider bottom-up effects. Um, there's also some top-down effects from alteration of aquatic food webs, which can um, alter the dynamics of um, grazers within the system as well as top predators which can also uh, lead to proliferation of blooms um, and that's been documented um, in, in, in several locations and one actually within Oregon was in Diamond Lake in the High Cascades where the the introduction of uh, tui chub, illegal introduction of tui chub uh, as, as, uh, as bait, as a live bait, 
uh, was linked to increased incidence of uh, cyanobacteria blooms. And the solution was to essentially poison the whole lake to try to eliminate the, uh, the, the, um, the fish, you know, killing all fish species within the water body. And, and um, for a while it seemed to have worked, but there's evidence that other, uh, either tui chub or, or other bait fish have been reintroduced, unfortunately, into the water body uh, recently. Um, next slide. Uh, so, you know, within Oregon, we do have uh, guidelines uh, related to cyanotoxins produced from cyanobacteria that, that help us issue advisories, both for recreational contact, as well as uh, uh, do not drink or, or drinking water advisories. Um, and we have those specifically for, uh, for, for cyanotoxins listed here uh, for recreational use, and then two specifically uh, for drinking water. Uh, for both uh, for vulnerable people, uh, young uh, people under the age of six, or who uh, have um, uh, 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 conditions that might be conducive for uh, um, um, be, well, be particularly vulnerable, I should say. And then we also have values for uh, adults, essentially. Um, and there are other toxins that are produced by cyanobacteria that may not be listed here. Um, and some of the research is still out to, to figure out um, what are the, the specific levels that could be um, harmful. Uh, next slide. Um, so over the past, uh, well, almost 20 years now, um, you know, the Oregon Health Authority um, and DEQ, we worked together to issue, uh, well, mainly through OHA, uh, recreational contact advisories based on cyanotoxin um, samples and, and prevalence of, of blooms across Oregon. And over the past 20, uh, almost 20 years, uh, uh, among about 60 water bodies, um, there's been over 200 advisories issued uh, across the state. And you can see it, it does range um, pretty much fully across the state, essentially where we have um, uh, you know, water bodies, essentially. So it is, it is a, a statewide issue. Um, and, and also, since the Salem water crisis that occurred in 2018, um, OHA has instituted some administrative rules uh, to require um, drinking water facilities uh, that are downstream or that are deemed susceptible of being impacted by um, cyanobacteria blooms to uh, sample regularly at their intakes during the, um, what we call the bloom season, which would be May through October. So every two weeks they need to take samples of raw water uh, for detection of cyanotoxins. Um, and so that's been in place since 2019. And so next, I'm gonna hand this off to Brian to talk about why we wanna use satellite imagery for cyanobacteria. Well, great, thanks, Dan. Um, so why should we, how does this connect to uh, remote sensing and satellite imagery? Uh, there's a lot of water bodies in Oregon, as you're all probably familiar. So field sampling and instrumentation is very costly and time consuming. Um, and we're limited by our resources and the staff available to sample all the water bodies. Because of that, it's geographically limited. Uh, and the sampling itself has limited temporal depth. Although part, as part of this work, uh, Dan put some sons in lakes in the Cascades that gathered continuous data. And you're going to see some of that. Uh, but really it's, it's rather limited, both temporally and geographically. And then what satellite imagery provides us is, and Dan wanted me to stress this, is it's fast and it's also very low cost. And it finds a very uh, low cost and efficient means for screening or monitoring uh, uh, harmful algal blooms or harmful cyanobacteria blooms, whatever acronym we wanna use. <clears throat> we can monitor more places and we can monitor them more frequently. And I'll show you uh, how uh, frequent that can be. Um, it also can help improve and has helped improve the efficiency and efficacy of the field sampling. So <clears throat> we have some evidence through the satellite imagery and the analysis of the satellite imagery that there's a potential harmful algal bloom. Uh, and so uh, we're, we have unfortunately an increased chance that there might be one there. And so we can target that sampling. Um, and, and as I'll sort of end with with the talk, as a good researcher, we're calling for more research. That'll be the end of the talk. Um, but having the satellite imagery, not, not just now or even for the four years that we've been doing this, but we have data from the past. There are sensors that, uh, similar sensors that are going back um, 10, 15 years or more that we can mine uh, to explore in, in addition to other uh, climactic, anthropogenic, and other factors. So <clears throat> this would be really nerdy. So um, I'm going to give an, a very brief overview of the remote sensing of harmful algal blooms. There's really three general areas. 
I've highlighted the ones that I'm going to talk about briefly in the box. Uh, but the, the sort of the Cadillac, and I use that term, is Cadillac even considered a good car anymore? Um, but the best version uh, would be where we can predict actual the species or community of cyanobacteria, which we can't do with the approaches that I'm going to show you. There's been some evidence that we can do that with hyperspectral remote sensing, but this is something that's really expensive. It's geographically and temporally limited. Um, there is a new sensor that just got sent up called PACE that is a hyperspectral sensor, uh, ocean color instrument, um, but it's uh, very coarse. It's coarser. It's a kilometer cell resolution, so it doesn't meet our needs. But the two types of satellites that we're looking at, but the ones that we focus on actually predict, predict cyanobacteria abundance, and the specific sensor that we're using can distinguish between uh, chlorophyll and the specific pigment phycocyanin uh, that we see in the toxic producing cyanobacteria. So uh, uh, the, uh, and that sensor is called Sentinel-3. There's two, 3A and 3B. It's a 300 meter cell resolution and it has a repeat time of one to two days, which is very good. Uh, the temporal resolution is very good. And um, as Dan has explained to me many times, um, the, you know, we need that good temporal depth uh, the quickness of that, because the blooms can de develop very quickly. Um, we're using data, as I'll show you in a second, from the EPA Cyan program that's already processed the Sentinel imagery and give, a, give us data uh, at, in cyan cyanobacteria abundance. The, the other, uh, other sensors that aren't focused on looking at chlorophyll or at looking specifically at algal blooms, like the Sentinel-3, um, have spectral bands that can map things like chlorophyll A or try to map phycocyanin. They have much higher spatial resolution. The, the, set, the satellite we're looking at is Sentinel-2, which is another satellite from the European Space Agency. It has a 10 meter spatial resolution, which means each little pixel represents a 100 square meter area, 30 times as resolute uh, as the 90,000 square meter area, single pixel of the Sentinel-3 satellite but it has a repeat time of five days. That higher spatial resolution has a price to pay. Okay, so I'm gonna actually look at that. The sensor we're not using right now, which is the Sentinel-2, um, it has a nine spectral bands, so it cuts up uh, the electromagnetic spectrum into nine bands. And I'm showing you this because we hope to use this in the future to supplement the work we're doing. Um, the sensor that we do use looks at the where the pigment phycocyanin is absorbed and reflected. Um, and so uh, this sensor, the phycocyanin absorption is at 620 nanometers. Okay, that's just the wavelength of electromagnetic energy. And you'll see here this, there, there isn't really a band that centers on 620. And in fact, there, um, there isn't a band that even includes that wavelength in this. So we can't really look at phycocyanin directly, but we can look at chlorophyll reflectance um, and, and backscattering because it has uh, bands in the wavelengths that cover that. And there are uh, algorithms and band indices like the normalized difference chlorophyll index that were designed for Sentinel-2 that can give us some idea of the potential for harmful algal blooms. But the sensor we're using uh, is the Sentinel-3 ocean land and color instrument. Um, and it's been processed, like I said, by the US EPA Cyan program. Um, it has optimal spectral bands and was designed for the mapping of uh, algal blooms and phytoplankton in the ocean, as well as freshwater algal blooms. Um, and it gives us the, the, we're using the data already derived from the EPA, which gives us data in cells per milliliter of uh, cyanobacteria abundance. But the advantage of this sensor over the one I just showed you is it includes spectral bands that focus on phycocyan. So the uh, uncertainty level is uh, significantly reduced um, because uh, of phytoplankton, we could be mapping just uh, non-harmful algal blooms or phytoplankton. The, uh, in this case, uh, the algorithm is focusing on the phycocyan and pigment. So it's a higher likelihood that we're, we're actually mapping cyanobacteria or harmful cyanobacteria. Um, and it uses a spectral shape algorithm that focuses on that, that absorption at 620 nanometers and the reflection at 709. The EPA does a lot of great error detection and processing. 
and they have a, uh, there's actually a paper um, at this link. You can get to all of the work that the EPA Cyan program through that link. Um, and the, their research has shown there's about an 85% correlation of actual cyanobacteria uh, blooms uh, with, with things that are at 100,000 cells per milliliter, um, which I think is, I always forget, it's the threshold of concern. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, it's, it's one of the WHO uh, suggested thresholds for so, the, uh, yeah, the UN, who agency uses that threshold as a threshold of concern. And so we've uh, used that here as well. So uh, to continue to bore you with more remote sensing, th these are all the bands on that uh, Sentinel-3 satellite. It has almost uh, around 20 bands. And the bands, again, are focused on looking at phytoplankton. So there's a band, band seven, that's centered on that 620 nanometers, which is exactly what phycocyanin is absorbed at. And it also has a band at 709 or technically 708.75, which is where we see phycocyanin reflectance. And the algorithm they use looks at the shape of the spectra there to fit to say, okay, there's very likely high uh, likelihood that we have phycocyanin here. <clears throat> so we, we've actually taken the data from the EAPA and process it. So here's an example of Odell Lake, which is up here on the Cascades. Uh, the color here is yellow is that 100,000 cells per milliliter threshold. Anything that's green is below that threshold and anything that's orange or red is at or above that threshold. And we start up here on the top left. I don't know how you're gonna be able to read that tiny font, but it starts in July 15th on the upper left and ends in August 2nd. So we see the bloom developing here. Uh, and we can see the spatial heterogeneity or the variability across the lake. The bloom doesn't really develop completely across the lake. It focuses on one area of the lake. It grows and actually uh, recedes for some time where it comes back again. And then by, by August 2nd, it's completely gone. <clears throat> okay, and so Dan's gonna talk a little more about our correlation with the in situ data. Yeah. And there's a reason that, that Ryan showed Odell Lake, and that that's because um, we've this has been a, an area that we've been uh, comparing the satellite in, information with on the ground measurements that we've been taking related to sound of bacteria. Um, so since 2019 um, on Odell Lake, and actually a, a series of lakes in the Cascades and the general in the area of the Upper Deschutes uh, Basin, uh, we've instrumented um, we've had sons placed, um, so water quality sons placed. Um, at strategic locations to, to characterize blooms. Uh, like Brian was showing, it was the southeast corner where the bloom was occurring. That's where we have a sond located. Um, and so what I'm showing here um, are from 2019 to 2021. And we do have 2022 data uh, that we've collected, just haven't been able to process it yet. Um, but what I'm showing here um, is a time series. And uh, to, to normalize across years, I've organized this by Julian Day. And each color shows a different... Um, um, uh, different year. And what I want to show here is um, on my left, your right, um, there's the satellite data abundance, and that's uh, simply the cell count estimates that are provided. And this is a, a lake level average. Um, there's different ways to, to represent um, lakes, but we're just choosing a lake level average here. Uh, and we, and on, the, um, on my right, your left, um, is the field measurements of phycocyanid, and these are uh, daily uh, averages. We, we actually take them every 15 minutes uh, with the songs. With, this is a, a daily average. Um, and so uh, we, what you can see here, just kind of just looking at this without doing any statistical analysis, is the timing um, and the magnitude of the, the field measurements, the satellite data, seem to compare pretty well with one uh, across one another. And that's across years. And then in 2020, for example, we actually didn't see a bloom on Odell. It was the first time in, in like five years there hadn't been a bloom in Odell. And that was also picked up um, by the, uh, the the satellites as well. Um, and so um, if you go to the next slide, I'm just give some summaries. And um, the takeaway so far, and there, there, there's actually more than that since we, there's a, a lot of data we've collected, just haven't uh, processed yet or, or analyzed them. But the satellite estimates and the water quality measures seem to correspond pretty well, um, at least in terms of the timing and the general pattern. Uh, if you get down to the exact correlations, as you can imagine, there seems to vary a little bit by year. And that, that probably has something to do with how we're spatially averaging uh, the, the measures in the lake versus our point measurements. Um, and even if we aligned up the cells with the points, they're probably 
could be some spatial variation that would complicate the correlations. Uh, there could be some calibration of the monitoring equipment, but still overall the satellite estimates and the, the, the on the ground measure, measurements of water quality seem to align fairly well. Um, I'm not, we haven't shown this here, but there's some other water quality measures that we took, including uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, things like that, that measure, uh, that would indicate productivity. Uh, and they tend to actually correlate a little more strongly than the phycocyanin measurements. And we're still trying to unpack why that might be the case. It could be due to spatial clumping of cyanobacteria within the water bodies versus where there might be more uniform response uh, to water quality, but we, we're still exploring that. So next slide. Oh, and so from that, you know, we have a, a field test. We've talked about the, the tool. And what I wanted to do next is um, actually uh, kind of showcase um, a web-based tool that's live now that we've developed this, this year. Um, let me share my screen. And hopefully this will, will work. Okay, for folks online, we're gonna do a little flip around here. So just be patient with us. Yeah, and guys... while they're doing that is, you know, we've, we've taken the, the satellite data that the EPA has provided. We've we've done the pilot study in the cascades to correlate it with the field sampling, and then develop this tool for stakeholders, for the public and partners to be able to monitor and and track the harmful algal blooms over time. Yeah. However, so when you're ready despite being able to do that, I can't figure out how to switch the screens. So <laughs> that's why I'm doing this remotely, so I don't have to deal with that's that. That's why Cinnamon <laughs> is here as well. <laughs> All right, Dan, can you wiggle around a little on that screen so we can yeah, see? Can you, and can folks you. online, can you tell us if you can see that okay? Can you just put a yes in the chat? All right, go ahead. We can good see you go. and everything looks good. Okay, yes. So uh, Brian provided the background here. And again, this is uh, this is data that, that the EPA um, uses as well. The EPA actually has their own, has, has a larger web-based app for across the nation. They've actually been doing some really interesting developments of this uh, lately. Uh, for our purposes though, uh, just focusing on Oregon, we wanted to have some different uh, functionality uh, with presenting the, the data. So we are taking the exact same data that you know, NASA provides the EPA uh, and, and, and process in the same way. And we're just visualizing it and displaying it a little bit differently. Um, so for this tool, um, again, this is live. Um, the, the, the link is in the presentation and if, if these presen this presentation is shared, you should be able to gain access to it. Um, but just to give an overview of it, um, you know, we have a little introduction section that provides the background, uh, kind of the, the, uh, the background of, of blooms and some re reference material to, to visit. Uh, I also want to point out that we are presenting cell count estimates, and that has no regulatory bearing whatsoever. Within Oregon, this is mainly informational, but it allows us to, um, to like again, uh, as Brian mentioned earlier, to maybe say, ask somebody on the ground in an area to go, hey, can you go take a look at this lake based on these these cell count estimates? Um, I should mention that you know we uh, right now we we update this website generally weekly during our, what we again call the bloom season, which is uh, May through October. Uh, we actually uh, are planning to actually continue it through the winter. We just haven't had a chance to update it since uh, late October. There's been some up upgrades to Arc Pro that we've, uh, or ArcGIS that have kind of messed with our Python scripts to doing it. So we're trying to work through those bugs. But nonetheless, we're, we're hoping to uh, provide pretty consistent updates even through the winter time. Um, so again, we have an introductory material. Um, and then this first box here, um, what we do each week is we, we calculate a seven day average daily maximum value for cyanobacteria for all of the resolvable water bodies, those 49 water bodies that we, we described earlier and summarize those in table format and organize them from greatest to least. So uh, as of the last week of October, which I guess was corresponded to the really massive change in weather that we experienced this fall uh, in, in Oregon, um, you can see that um, we had 11 water bodies that had uh, at some point within the uh, the previous, uh, well, sorry, the, had the seven day of daily maximum value of cells um, above 100,000 cells um, for the water body. And some of these are maybe not that surprising. Upper Klamath Lake is pretty consistent bloomer. Um, we've seen pretty consistent blooms out in the snake, uh, uh, out in the uh, Brownlee Reservoir in the snake uh, throughout the season. And then uh, things like Diamond Lake actually showed up again uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we have this as kind of a general overview. Um, and this just displays the water bodies. But what's probably even uh, more interesting um, is if you scroll down to this, uh, to a, this data visualization box that we have, 
And what that allows us to do is to scroll down. Uh, well, let's go to let's go to Diamond Lake since I mentioned that, um, and select the water body. And I'll take just a second to update. And what that does is it gives you, for one, um, the previous week's thumbnails um, images for Diamond Lake um, displayed again on the scale of, uh, and, and you can see the spatial variation based on these bins that we've adopted from the WHO. Um, and we're also able to plot the do a time series plot. Um, and we have some different functionality in terms of how you want to display it. If you want to do a log scale, it'll, it'll allow you to maybe, maybe it'll see it a little bit easier. Um, but we, we default um, by um, presenting the, the, the current year, but we are able to um, go all the way back in time to say, uh, to at least to 2017 or 2016, to get a time series to look at maybe some general patterns that we might see for blooms um, within a water body. And you know, we have some different statistics that we've calculated, at least at the lake level, that you can look at. Um, but we think this we think this could be pretty useful for uh, kind of looking at um, like different uh, characteristics of lakes or, or maybe groups of lakes and, and their bloom characteristics over time to get kind of a uh, like a, almost a lake topology in terms of uh, temporal sequence of blooms. Um, I should also mention that all the data that we're plotting are available for download. You can come down to the bottom and uh, export it to uh, probably CSV or Excel. I mean, we have PDF, even though I, I doubt anyone would export it to a PDF value at this point. Um, but so yeah, so that's that's the overview of the tool. And um, again, it's um, we're, we're, it's constantly being updated too. So we, we, always, we always welcome feedback as well as, you know, if there's something else that maybe we might wanna to add to this. So we, we have our own internal list of things that we wanna to do to, to keep um, updating the tool, but it's always useful to get um, outside feedback as well. Um, so- I got one addition to that, Dan. Could you show all the, the thumbnails just for a second? So I'm a methods guy, right? And this is an academic audience. So, you know, um, one thing that we're hiding, we're not hiding. But one of the things that we want to deal with is um, where it's blue here, it actually, the gray is a non-detect, um, which means the satellite picked up something and didn't detect anything or detect it was below the threshold. But where it's blue means the satellite didn't necessarily get a reading. So we have things like clouds in Oregon, right? So, um, you know, we have to account for that. And so some days we might actually not get a complete date, complete uh, the lake might not be covered completely. So we, we have to account for that. We haven't fully accounted for it yet. And, you know, somebody told me once a long time ago, it's okay not to talk about the bad things with the research, but I think it's not a bad thing. It's one thing that we have to deal with, right? So, yeah. um, and, and Dan has brought up to me more than once. So yeah. I just thought it's a good visual to show that here. So. Yeah, no, thanks, Brian. And so I, I think if we have time after the, the, the presentation, we could we could always come back to this app if folks want to explore a little bit more, look at some different data, but maybe we should finish the, the presentation and then we can um, delve into that later on. So I'll stop okay. sharing now and hopefully this will work to switch back. One day I'll be able to do this. Thanks, Dan, that was great. Yeah, you can start there. Wonderful, thank you so much. So, you know, to me, this tool is the sort of um, the, the, our success. We've done, processed all this data. We thought it through. We had the, the uh, work that continues in the cascades as uh, pilot studies for correlating with in situ data, but getting this far really is um, success. So the fact that we've gotten here, uh, we've, is, it, to me, a great success story as a geospatial practitioner working in conservation. You know, I was talking to David beforehand that what did I do? I didn't even process this imagery. EPA gave it to me, but I processed it and helped push the project forward in consultation with the expert of working on the aquatic ecology itself, Dan, and, and then with uh, Yuan, who should get a, a tremendous amount of credit programming that in our shiny. And, and without her, this, that wouldn't exist, right? So she's really fundamental to this project. And Aaron Costello at D, uh, DEQ, we have these uh, cyan reports, and they've become a very important part of DEQ uh, decision making in Oregon. And so it's to me, it's, you know, I know we always like to cr critique things, but it's a great example of the federal government working with state government 
and researchers to produce something that's now actually uh, enhancing our monitoring in the state. Um, and we, so not only do we have the reports, we have the anal analysis of time series data on the cell counts to identify the frequency, extent, and magnitude of those blooms on those 49 large water bodies that resolve from the Cyan satellite. And because of that, it's improved communication across agencies and stakeholders uh, on the detection and sampling of blooms. And Dan, is, do, are we sending people out sampling to the lakes? Is that more of a frequent occurrence now? Well, yeah, I mean, what we started to, and actually we're, I've got a proposal in within our, our section within DEQ to formalize this, but we're, we're trying to, um, but this past year, what I have been doing is when we look at these reports, um, I'll reach out to our, our basin coordinators within the state that have different assignments um, across the state to say, just to give them a heads up saying, hey, this water body seems to have evidence of a bloom. Is there anyone on the ground or do you have any information you could could gather? And then we also have started to inform OHA saying, just to get let you know, this could be a possible area of concern. Um, it's been a little, it, we don't really have a, a, a complete formalized process yet for doing that. But again, I've, I've got a proposal and uh, to basically do that and provide more explicit training on how we could use these data um, for uh, sampling um, purposes. And, and I'll probably talk about it in a sec. We're not the only ones doing this. And uh, Idaho, I know, has implemented a similar tool. They're not exact. I think Dan went to a talk yesterday morning or this morning from Wyoming. Wyoming is working on something. Um, so there are, Utah, I know, has uh, developed uh, tools using the EPA Cyan data. So, uh, so there's a large partnership that's released uh, throughout the country. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> so we have a lot of success. What are the challenges? There's always challenges. Um, the first one is we're really limited to only larger water bodies. And that's kind of a big limitation. The Sentinel-3 is 300 meter square. So we're talking about the minimum unit of analysis is 90,000 90, square meters. That actually has to go under an error detection. Any pixels that are land and water get thrown out. So you have to have enough core area for it to map. Um, and and I think it's important because I saw somebody say, oh, I want to use this, this, which I think people should. But the one thing to be clear is we're map mapping cyanobacteria concentrations, not toxins. So we can get yeah. false positives. The satellite we're using has a higher, very high likelihood that it could be potentially toxins because we're looking at that phycocyanin, but it's not toxins. We're not mapping toxins directly. So that's really crucial to understand. We also have issues with the remote sensing itself. Um, we get in shallow water environments, we can get bottom reflectance from benthic algae and other sources that give us false positives. In the Cascades, there's at least one lake where we've had that. There's no uh, um, cyanobacteria blooms. There's really just a shallow water lake that's uh, with high cell count. So we get those false positives. Um, also things like high turbidity and obviously clouds can give us false positives or no data. I was highlighting that with the tool and one very important thing, as um, there's researchers at OSU looking at this, but the, the blooms themselves can start deeper in the water column. And I think they often do, right, Dan? Um, and yeah, so yeah. The, the satellites themselves only detect superficial blooms within one or two meters. So we're looking, if a bloom is developing deeper in the water column, we're not getting it right away, right? We're seeing it after it's developed. And again, these are challenges. It doesn't make us stop from doing what we want, but we want to contextualize what we're doing within that. But those challenges also give us opportunities. Again, being a good researcher, my research is just calling for more research. Um, so one of the things we really want to do, and we're actually have written a grant already uh, to add higher resolution satellite imagery to Sentinel-2 specifically to map these smaller water bodies, despite the limitations. Uh, we think it'll add uh, a lot to the tool, give us the ability to at least monitor some of those uh, significant wider uh, uh, set of water bodies. And then two longer term goals, which uh, I think are really interesting and could potentially really enhance it. The first is to build an early watering system based on a probability model that uses the time series available satellite data, not just the data we're using, um, I glossed over, there was a, a precursor to the Sentinel-3 OLCI called Maris, which was sort of the test satellite. And that goes back quite a bit, I think 15 years. 
and we can mine that and other easily accessible data to build a more uh, statistically robust model that gives us some prediction capability before those blooms. You know, when we first starting seeing the signal, uh, that's really when, when we want to act, not after we see the bloom uh, develop. Um, and in sort of conjunction with that, uh, we want to look at the factors influencing booms. And we know there's a lot of variability, heterogeneity, not within lakes, but between lakes. And so to do uh, more of a high level uh, spatial analysis that incorporates other variables like physiographic, climactic, anthropogenic, um, and morphological factors that, that are leading to HABs. And so um, we really think that along with the early warning systems will enhance the work we're doing and provide a, a more long-term uh, 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 you know, long-term stability to the project. And, and really, instead of just looking and reacting to haves, we can start looking deep about what's potentially causing them. Yeah. And Brian, I just want to add, you know, again, we're not working in a vacuum here. There's, there's a number of other folks, both national, you know, both at the federal level, state level researchers that are working on similar tools and concepts. And, and we are familiar with some of those for like an early warning system. There's a great tool that's been developed for the Ohio River system that I just saw a presentation on that's using Bayesian approaches to do that. And that's sort of similar to kind of what I'm thinking uh, for this type of uh, early warning tool. And there's also a lot of work being done nationally uh, looking at lake topologies or, or basically developing some you know, hierarchical models to, to, to investigate causes for blooms. So it's, it's something that, that fits with what's being done currently. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Yeah, and, and you know, um... And I know a lot of work was done in the Great Lakes, right? So a lot of that, a lot of the yep. work, sort of forward-looking work is done in other parts of the countries, but it's a real partnership. And so we all learn from each other. And we want, you know, there's a number of people in our local area we want to thank. Uh, Rochelle Laviosa at EPA Region 10, Amalia Handler uh, at EPA Ord, Smita Mehta at OEDQ, and Steve Hansen. And... Uh, especially Blake Schaefer at US EPA, who's responsible for generating the processed cyanobacteria accounts. So that's the end of our talk. And now we can take some questions. All right, everybody, remember, if you have a question, um, just raise your hand and I will bring you the mic and we'll start with a question for online. Um, first one, I think you addressed this already, but maybe you could elaborate. Um, can you see periods when the blooms sink and the satellite uh, doesn't see the bloom because it's no longer at the surface? And, and that it, is that confirmed by the SOM data? Well, that's a, yeah, Dan, yeah, you want to take this? Yeah, I can. Well, yeah, I was thinking about that because I saw Kurt pose that. Um, so, um, and we can definitely see, you know, temporally, we can see, um, you know, spatial differences in blooms, like like you showed with Odell Lake. Uh, occurring, and that could be due to sinking uh, or going below the the one to two meter depth. Um, unfortunately, for our SON measurements, you know, as opposed, to, and I know that Kurt's got the uh, the um, uh, the SONs that he can vary depth with uh, within uh, with some of the reservoirs and the Cascades. Our SONs are at fixed locations, and that's done primarily for security reasons, since we're going to we have the SONs out there a long time. And these are high recreation area so risking having the sons uh, at buoys at different depths and, and we we can only afford to have one or two sons out at a time uh, so we we can't confirm that uh, from son data but the satellite data probably we, we probably could with some maybe uh, some time kind of to, to examine to see if, if things are sinking or, or, or rising uh, over time we'd have to think about that with uh, with other data we might need to uh, yeah to see that I mean that's a great question, and and it's um, we just need uh, more more uh, resources to do the studies. Um, but it's, again, it's a good researcher, um, and it's, I think the two ways we to deal with that is to look at the spatial heterogeneity. We haven't really focused on looking at spatial trends lake by lake, which would feed into the typology where we might see something rising to the surface that is it indicative of something that's happening lower, and and then. A, uh, Dan's statistical models are looking at sort of running averages, and Dan, you, if I'm uh, generalizing it too much, and for predictive purposes, which is temporal based, but we could do similar things that are spatially based in the lake. So as we see yeah. the bloom developing in one area, it might be indicative 
of well, something happening deeper in the lake. And I, I will say, maybe, and I forgot to mention this as well, is we, we do have lake profile data for Odell at, at times during the blooms that there is some indication that there is a phycocyanin peak at depth earlier uh, before the blooms get to the surface. Um, but we have to analyze that a little bit more in depth, so. And well, the other thing is we, we had talked about, what, wasn't there also um, dragging the sand along a boat to get some variability around one lake? Uh, well, we, we sampled at point locations. We didn't drag the sand around. That wasn't really, yeah, that wasn't, we, 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 we basically just had different vertical profile points within Odell and, and Crescent lakes. I think, you know, I think it would be useful to get that kind of data though, yeah. if we had it. Good question. All right, any questions in the room? We'll take turns back and forth. I figured for once I'll do the running. Um, so I have a question if the scripts that you use to pull the data off the satellites are all available online on GitHub and if it's possible to download all of the data at once with one click without having to go in all of the lakes one well, by one. Because yes. I think that could make for great class projects or student projects, but the scripts and data have to be publicly available. Yeah, we easy. have. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for that question. We, we, we do have our, our GitHub site, I think, listed on the, the website at the bottom. Uh, yeah, it's at our GitHub repository. So you can look at that and see what, what scripts we're using. Um, and it's a combination, uh, you know, R Shiny, is, we, we use R for doing a lot of the, the analysis and public and the, the, the Shiny app tool development. Uh, Python is really the driver for uh, gathering and processing the data because we need to access uh, ArcPy to do so. Uh, and so, and all the, all that information and instructions are on the GitHub site. Um, all the data are actually available at that NASA site that was shown earlier, um, and you should be able to link to it through the website as well. Um, yeah, right here as well. Um, unfortunately, um, you, I think that's a point and click at this point. We the, our scripts are developed to uh, grab that data um, off the website and process it. Um, there may be other scripts that have been developed by others that would be able to do that, but, um, or that could be a good class project <laughs> itself, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I want to add it to my remote sensing class. So you can email me. I'll help you do it. Yeah. And I think it's a brilliant idea. I'd also like to get rid of the Esri component of the script that I created and put it into R or Python. Yeah, we've been, so, I've, we've been looking at doing GeoPandas tools. I actually just, I already started to yeah. do it, but I haven't told Dan that yet. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got a question online. Go ahead, Michael Banks. So uh, this is from uh, Amelia Handler, who I noticed was one of your special people. Flores, curious to hear how you dealt with false positives due to bottom reflection, reflectance. Do you just have to learn over time which lakes for which this is an issue? Or have you thought about how to flag that in the imagery? So which specific thing I missed the very beginning? Reflectivity off the shallow lakes, is that correct? Oh, false yeah, positives. So, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, so, oh, good, so, good, right. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, so this is a big issue in any kind of uh, shallow water remote sensing, which I do uh, not just in for harmful algal bloom. So, and so it's very difficult because the, the it, this is a difficult issue to deal with. And I think one way to do it is an actually with a typological analysis where, where we know the bathymetric components of the lake. And so we flag it that way, as opposed to mapping, uh, flagging it potentially with processing of the reflectance. So we, for this project, we're already getting the derived data. So it's already been processed by the EPA into cyanobacterial levels. And so if it indicates in a, a false positive in that lake, you know, for this project, we're probably not going to recreate that wheel, although we could. Um, I think that a functional way to do that is bathymetrically, like literally with another data set saying, we know this is a shallow water lake. So it sort of flags it uh, as, as potentially a false positive. And, but it's a good and, question. And I should add this, Brian may not be aware of that we did this since uh, um, within DAQ recently. We have gone through uh, some of the water bodies that are consistently showing high counts that uh, and we've had uh, on the ground uh, confirmation uh, for like, like I said, Davis Lake, for example, shallow water, we've, we've had visual confirmation that it's, it's a bloom. There's Sturgeon Lake uh, constantly comes up and the, and the Columbia is, is having high blooms and it, it can be blooms there, but it's also it's like a foot deep. Uh, it, could, it could be an issue with that. So right now it's, it's kind of, it's more like multiple lines of evidence that we use to determine whether 
the satellite imagery is indicating uh, is indicating a bloom. Um, by default, we say, well, it's saying it. Let's let's go take a look and see, and then we use that as a decision point going forward whether it's a likely bloom or it's one that may be flagged for having uh, interferences based on local conditions. Yeah, and and for the remote sensing community, if there's anybody, I, it's really hyperspectral. Might be able to distinguish benthic algae from these algae, but we're we're not using hyperspectral, so that's not. Okay, I'm going to be selfish and ask a question. Um, <laughs> this is Cinnamon. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where we're at with doing this kind of sensing in estuaries? Simply because that's where most of our uh, um, aquaculture happens in Oregon. So I was just curious if we're able to track there yet. S sensing, uh, what are we sensing in the estuary? Any, any HAB kind of work in the estuaries. Is any of that work being done? Yeah. Can you? So they've do expanded the. The, the OLCI isn't, it's, it's an ocean color instrument, so it's not just used for this function at all. And the cyan program not, didn't originally include the marine environments, but now they've included the marine environment. So the, those pixels are included for Oregon. So that, this is already starting to do that. Um, <clears throat> we know that in the marine environment, it's really dinoflagellates. And so there's different uh, different things that we would want to map. We might use different, although this is, they've seen good correlations with the hat, oddly, those red tides. That's very strange, but really we'd, to focus on those types of blooms, we might want to use other algorithms that this, that the uh, cyan program has used, but it's, it's still, they've expanded the pixels out to the marine area because it's shown to be uh, still pretty useful. So. Nice. That's exciting. Yeah. All right, it looked like we had another question online. So, uh, so from uh, Amelia Handler, um, what, no, sorry, Rachel, what method are you using when you take water samples? What machine method are you using once you have the water samples? Boy, I don't know if I can reference the EPA method for doing the analysis. Um, I, I will say we're using um, YSI data sons. And so we have uh, we have uh, pro uh, you know um, um, sensors that are used to detect uh, you know um, dissolved oxygen, temperature, specific conductance, uh, phycocyanin, and chlorophyll A. Uh, I don't have the exact sensor names um, <laughs> off the top of my head. Uh, but we're using YSI instrumentation. We have we have standards within our laboratory to calibrate those um, and check the calibration over time of deployment. Um, we take water samples and we process that according to our DEQ laboratory standards. Um, and uh, for say we, we we take we've been taking nutrient samples as well out there, uh, both the uh, total forms and dissolved forms of, of nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, as, as well as silica, which is important for diatom. Um, production within freshwater systems. Um, so if you're interested in the specific lists, I, I can look up the quaps and the specific uh, uh, equipment, but overall it's a, it's a YSI sond and we have uh, we have uh, standard methods for taking water samples. Brian, can you take us back to everybody's uh, email addresses? Which so if one? you have the last slide where you have everyone's email. So if you oh. have questions, follow-up questions for Dan, you can reach out. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sounds great. Looks like we've got before we go there, hang on. Are there any questions in the room? All right, questions online. <laughs> um, so this one is, are there blooms that are likely to be recent or are there enough data to decide? Um, are there blooms that are... are... Yeah. Maybe I, I wouldn't mind the context because the, these um, the satellite imagery that we're producing is within the past week. So it is recent data that we're using oh, yeah. to evaluate blooms. Uh, and we have data that the satellite imagery goes back to uh, 2016. So we have a six year record of blooms. I mean, so maybe, and maybe the question is, and I'm reading into it is how quickly do we get a result? Like how quickly? And to be honest, I, I've forgotten it's a day or two though, right? It's not that- Yeah, well, the, the, the data from NASA are available the day after, like the, the following day. So usually like if, we, if, we're, if we're running our updates on Monday um, and, and I should say for our purposes, uh, based on our time allotment and resources, we only do one update a, a week unless we get requests from specific people to do uh, more frequent updates because it does take a little bit of time to download and process the data. Um, but we're so if we download it Monday, the data are, are the, the last data available is usually from Sunday. So it, it is a pretty quick turnaround time when the imagery gets uploaded uh, 
to be available for download. All right, I'm looking around the room again. Any other questions online? <laughs> yes, online oh. takes it again. Okay, so, so the person that asked that last question said, yes, but are, the, are new blooms occurring or where, but are new blooms occurring or where they always happening? Were well, they always happening? I mean, no, the, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think we haven't really, unless Dan has been doing something, which it could be, and um, where we haven't really explored the EPA did an analysis of the frequency and magnitude of, of blooms, but they summarized that by the state level. And so what we really want to do is that do that same thing with this data that we, we've been processing. And I'm not sure we've really done it, like do a whole analysis of, okay, using this data and perhaps even hind casting, what, what lakes, what timing, how frequent, the magnitude, and, and I think that would be an important part of the typology analysis and the early warning system. We, I don't think we've gotten to doing that yet, really. Is that right, Dan? We haven't really well, mined I, the I, data. I, I think I'm trying to adjust the question. I think the question, from what I'm understanding, are, you, are, are we just looking at blooms where they're always occurring? Or can we detect new ones in different water bodies that come on? And the answer is yes for both. And, the, and we haven't done the deep dive into the analysis because again, we're, we're more interested right now getting this up and running. Uh, and, and as we uh, move forward, we can then go back and look more specifically at that type of question about are there lakes that consistently bloom or are there ones that may not have in the past but are now currently blooming um, or are ones in the past that are blooming, you know, no longer blooming. There's, there's different directions that we can go with that. And part of that, you know, we have our six years worth of data and there is, you mentioned the Maris data. We, we haven't done this yet, but we could go back through and kind of hindcast. Uh, using the Maris data as well. And I know that, I know Amalia is on here and I know that she's already working on that at the national scale. So, but that's something that we want to do at the state level as well. Great Good question. All right, question in the room. Although the false positives could be um, annoying or just, you know, a few of them would be annoying, but it really the real problem is false negatives missing blooms and you said that the ones you've seen in your data set are based on sensor limitations because the blooms are too deep in the water column for the sensor to pick up or, so, or there's clouds or other yeah. things yeah so these are things that that sensor limitations not not your process so is there is there ways to address that or do you really are you looking to um nasa or whoever it is who makes the sensors to it, adjust it's a good question we'll, we'll take clouds i I had a student, I teach remote sensing and they, I've been teaching them about cirrus bands that get rid of clouds. And they're like, you're not using, you just taught us about that. Why don't you use that? But so there's one thing remote sensing does, but those are high clouds. And the problem we have generally are low clouds. There's no way, it's very difficult to extract them. And at some level it's a limitation, right? So there could be, there are sensors developing and a lot of the hyperspectral sensors, some active sensors that can peer through clouds. So in the future, um, and there might be some algorithmic was, but this is sort of a, a big limitation of remote sensing to some degree, at, at least where it is now, right? So it's, it's difficult to address. But one way to address it is get as much data as we can, start using other satellites that maybe on one day we have a cloud and the day that the satellite isn't passing over, we get another data set where it's cloud free. It's kind of a, well, not a great answer to the question. But. And Brian, I want to I add on to this and I want to get your thoughts on this because I know that we've talked about this in the past. And one thing that's becoming more pervasive, uh, especially on the east side of the state during summer when we tend to see more blooms is more forest fires and smoke cover. And smoke would also be potentially an interference, even though I think we have seen bloom detections during some of the higher, during some of the hazier days. But that that is something that I think could be both in terms of an interference in terms of detecting blooms, and I have a suspicion it may be affecting the actual dynamics of blooms in the Cascades as well. So you're asking us if there's methods to sort of extract out smoke and, and yeah. clouds. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, clouds and smoke are similar in some respects and different in others in terms of the ability to, to um, correct for, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. I, I, I think there's people are actually looking into this now as the wildfires are growing. 
Um, so, but I haven't seen much development in that level that's really practical to apply to do it. So this is sort of a limitation, but it's also a challenge. There's possibilities to use some of the other bands to look at, to extract it out, to sort of um, uh, um, correct for those issues. But I don't know of anything that's, that's effective at the moment. So it's a good question though. All right. Any other questions in either location? All right, I think we have come to the end of our time as well. So if we could give our speakers uh, one more round of applause. And I just wanna thank you both for dancing back and forth. You did that pretty seamlessly between the two, one here, one there. Uh, that's the best I've seen thus far. So nice job, both of you. You've had two um, and a half years for... of practice, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, for everybody uh, in the room and everyone online, uh, have a good couple of days off and we'll see you at the end of the month. Uh, come back and join us. Thanks, everybody. Thank yep. you both. Thank you, Cinnamon. Thank you. Good job, Dan. All right, Ryan, I'm going to take off. I got to join another meeting here. It's been a jam. Okay, we'll talk. Stuff. Let's talk uh, after Thanksgiving. Sounds good. Talk okay. to you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Dan. Thank you. Yep, thanks. All right, for folks online, we're going to end the presentation now. Thank you.